My name is Obe Madagana. You can follow along with my lecture, which can be found on the SCT website. Before formally defining the maximum flow problem, let's get an intuition of what we're trying to do. If we look at this directed graph and imagine it as a network of pipes, with the vertex S being an unlimited water source and vertex T being an unlimited sink, you can see how the water would flow along the edges to reach T, the sink. This begs the question of the maximum amount of water that can be transported from the source to the sink by our pipe network. Of course, that depends on how much water each pipe can transport in a given amount of time, as well as the pipe connections themselves. So let's make this idea a little more concrete. We have a directed graph with no self loops, as shown. Note that you can have cycles, such as V2 to V1 to V3. Each edge weight in this graph we know as the capacity from now on. Like the name suggests, the capacity of each edge represents the maximum amount of flow that this edge can take. Next, we define a flow function that represents the amount of flow currently going through an edge. In the network shown, each edge is labeled with a fraction. The numerator is the flow function for that edge, and the denominator is the capacity of the edge. For example, from the edge from S to V1 has a flow of 11 and a capacity of 16. You may notice that none of the flow values through any edge exceeds that edge's capacity. This is one of two important constraints that we have to enforce to maintain a realistic behavior in the network. The two constraints are first, that the flow through an edge cannot exceed the capacity of the edge, called the capacity constraint, and second, that the flow into a vertex has to equal the flow out of a vertex. For example, if you look at V1, it has 11 units of flow coming in from the source and one unit of flow coming in from V2, making 12 total units of flow in, and it also has 12 units of flow out, so it satisfies, satisfies this constraint. Note that this balance constraint does not apply to S and T, our source and sink. We assume the source is able to produce as much flow as we need, and the sink is able to receive as much flow as we give it. So how do we go about finding the maximum flow? One useful concept is the residual network. You can think of this network as representing the changes we can make to our original network. For example, given the original network on the left and the residual network on the right, you can see that they have the same vertices and the same sort of structure. For each edge uh, from S to V1, for the edge from S to V1 with a flow value of 11 and a capacity of 16, you can increase the flow through that edge by up to five units without overcoming the edge's capacity. So the residual network has an edge in the same direction as the original edge with a weight of five units. Similarly, we can reduce the flow through the edge by up to 11 units. So our residual network has an edge in the reverse direction with a weight of 11 units to represent a decrease. You should pause and ponder until that makes sense to you. The edge from V1 to V3 is already filled to capacity. So we can only add a reverse edge to represent decreasing flow through it because we always can't increase because that edge would have a weight of zero. So we can omit it. If you go through the edge by edge in the original network, you can see that each corresponding edge or pair of edges in the residual network has a weight of the maximum possible increase or decrease we can perform on the flow value. So why is this useful? Well, if we can find a simple path between S and T on the residual graph, then every edge on that path can take more flow. This means that we can augment the flow of each edge on that path by at least one without breaking our constraints. We call this path the augmenting path. You can see the augmenting path highlighted in the residual network on the right. But by how much can we augment the flow? In the augmenting path highlighted, there are three edges used, with capacities 5, 4, and 5 respectively. Intuitively, if we try to push 5 more units of flow through this path, the residual edge of length 4 would be unable to take it. In the original graph, the pseudo is trying to pull 5 units of flow from the edge between V3 and V2 that only has 4 units of flow at the moment. Clearly, that doesn't make sense because you can't have negative flow. Extending this logic, we can only augment the flow along an augmenting path by the minimum edge weight along that path. We call this value the residual capacity, and it tells us how much more flow we can push along this path. This is just an initial idea to find the maximum flow through a flow network. If we keep finding augmenting paths and increasing the flow through every edge along that path by the residual capacity, we'll probably arrive at the maximum flow. It turns out that this idea is actually correct, and it's a valid way to find the maximum flow. In fact, it's one of the first ways we'll discuss. One of the tenets of the min, max flow min cut theorem is the fact that when the flow is maximized, there is no augmenting path, which makes sense because if there is a valid augmenting path, our current flow value can't be the maximum because if we augment along that path, our flow value will increase. Before discussing the other tenet of the max flow min cut theorem, we need to understand what cuts are in the first place. A cut is a separation of the source and the sink. Think of cutting some edges until there is no longer a path from the source to the sink. There are many cuts of this network. You could remove edges from S to V1 and V2, or you can remove the edges from V1 to V3 and V2 to V4. More formally, 
A cut is a split of the vertices in our flow network into two sets, S and T. The set S contains the vertex S, our source, and the set T contains the vertex T, our sink. You can see how this vertex partitioning is equivalent to the edge cut we just discussed. Not all cuts are equal, and if you remember the name of the theorem we just discussed, we're interested in the min cut. So what exactly does it mean for a cut to be the minimum? Well, we can define the capacity of a cut as the sum of the capacities of the edges that connect the set S to the set T. Think about that for a moment. Going back to our previous understanding of a cut, where we partition the graph by removing edges, the cut capacity there would be the sum of the capacities of the edges we remove, but only those that point toward the sink. In this graph, for example, if we cut out the two edges between S and V1 and S and V2, thus partitioning the graph into one vertex set with only S and one vertex set with every other vertex, including T, the capacity of the cut would be 16 plus 13 because it's the capacities of the two edges. However, if we partitioned it in any way, or cut, I guess, our cut used uh, the reverse edge from V3 to V2, we would not include that capacity of 9 when calculating the cut capacity because it does not go in the direction of uh, this vertex at T. If you're desperate to know why the maximum min cut theorem is true, then CLRS has a detailed proof. And finally, we arrive at our first algorithm to solve the maximum flow problem. But forward focusing is more of a method than an algorithm because this is really just a framework that many algorithms with varying complexities draw from. Anyway, let's go through the zero code. The first for loop initializes the flow of every edge to zero. The while loop logic relies on the second tenet of the max flow of min cut theorem. That once we can no longer find an augmenting path, we have our answer. So while there exists an augmenting path in our graph, we find the residual capacity along that path and iterate through the edges in the path, augmenting their flows by the residual capacity. Since every augmentation increases our flow value by at least one, our method is guaranteed to converge the maximum flow for integral flow values. Note that the forward focusing method does not specify how exactly we find the augmenting path. That's why it's a framework more than an algorithm, as our choice here is important to ensure that our algorithm runs reasonably fast. The edmonds carp algorithm is an implementation of Fort Fulkerson that uses a BFS to find an augmenting path. A Python implementation of the algorithm is linked in the written lecture, parts of which can be seen here. Let's analyze the time complexity. Every time we find an augmenting path in the residual network, whichever edge on the path had a minimum capacity and thus set the residual capacity for the path will be filled completely and thus will not show up again on future residual networks. However, it may show up again as a reversed edge, representing a removal of flow from that edge. In the context of the previous graph, there was an edge with capacity 12 from the source. So if that edge was not completely filled, if it was the edge that set the residual capacity, it would have been filled on a certain augmentation, and it would not show up again in future uh, residual networks. However, it may show up again as a reverse edge of capacity 12, or weight 12, to represent removing 12 total units of flow from that edge. It can be shown that this uh, reverse edge happening again happens at most v over 2 times per edge, so the total number of augmentations is bounded by O of E. Since each augmentation takes O of E in Fort Fulkerson, the overall time complexity of Edmonds Carp is O of V E squared. This is sufficient for most pro competitive programming flow problems, but some require a faster method. One such technique that is both asymptotically and practically faster is called push relabel. Push relabel, like Fort Fulkerson, is a method that many algorithms draw from. During the operation of push relabel algorithms, flow conservation is not strictly maintained. Instead, we maintain a value called a preflow that allows vertices to have more flow in than flow out. Essentially, this is a relaxation of our previous constraint the vertices had to have the same amount of flow in as there was flow out. Now instead we say that uh, excess flow in is fine, and we call that excess the excess flow, which is the delta between flow in and flow out, which must be greater than or equal to zero. There are two main operations suggested by the name. We can push preflow, or we can relabel a vertex. Before we discuss those, we have to define one more concept, the height of a vertex. Each vertex is a height value that will change with relabel operations. Since the sink has a height of zero through the operation of the algorithm, the operation of push relabel resembles sort of pushing flow down a hill 
or more accurately, changing the height of the hill dynamically so gravity does the work for us and the flow just flows down toward the sink. Before commencing any push or relabel operations, we first have to set the preflow from the source. The first and second for loops initialize flows, excesses, and heights to zero. Three statements in the last for loop do three things. They push the maximum amount of flow out from the source to get the algorithm moving. They set the excess flow of the vertices proximate to the source, so the vertices that had flow pushed to them now have this amount of excess. And they set the excess of the source to be negative. The push operation on an overflowing vertex, i.e. one that has an excess flow greater than zero, pushes as much excess flow possible to a neighbor V. So the push operation is called if and only if the height of the current vertex that has some overflow minus the height of the neighboring vertex is equal to one. What this means is that we only ever push flow downhill and between vertices that have a height differential of one. The relabel operation, however, is called when a vertex U with some excess flow has no neighbors with proper height. So what we do is we increase the height of U to one plus the minimum height of its neighbors. I'll say that again. We increase the height of U to one plus the minimum height of its neighbors. The variation, the variations among push label algorithms mostly come down to unique ways of choosing what node, node, node reprocess in what order. But the generic algorithm has the complexity of O of E squared E, which is an improvement over Edmunds card. So if we look at the actual pseudocode here, we're calling the set preflow function to initialize everything and push flow out from the source to begin with and set excesses. And then the actual code is very simple. While there exists some node with some amount of overflow, if there exists a neighbor to that node that we can push flow to, then we push flow. Otherwise, we relabel uh, this vertex to have the height of one plus the minimum height of its neighbors. So it's guaranteed to have a neighbor to push flow to now. And then next iteration we push, etc., until there are no more vertices with excess flow, which in this case means that if we go to our sink, then the amount of flow coming into the sink is our maximum flow. If you want a more detailed explanation of how this was derived, you can go to CLRS. So bipartite matching algorithms are the most common use of flow algorithms in competitive programming settings because bipartite graphs are just like really important in competitive programming. For example, there was a code gen problem. One of the last code gen problems uh, was partly bipartite matching and solution. Uh, so a bipartite graph is a graph whose vertices are split into two disjoint sets. Uh, so sets that don't share any vertices. The sets uh, only have edges. There are only edges in the graph that bridge the two sets. So if you look at uh, the diagram on the left, you have two sets L and R. All the edges in the graph bridge L and R in the sense that there are no edges uh, between two vertices in L or two vertices in R. The sets are usually visualized vertically like that to make it easier to see. And the maximum bipartite matching is the subset of edges of maximum size such that no two edges share an endpoint. So the maximum matching here is highlighted. So the maximum matching has three uh, vertices from each set. And there's no way to pick three vertices from each set that have, or more than three vertices from each set that don't share any endpoints. So you're essentially matching uh, one vertex from each set with another from the other without uh, overlapping endpoints. So the way we solve this problem using flow algorithms is to create what are called super sources and super sinks, because this graph as it stands does not have an, a source or a sink yet, so we make one for them. So we create a source and create edges from the source to every vertex in our L set in this case. You could reverse L and R, it doesn't really matter. And then we create, we turn the non-directed edges uh, from L to, between, between L and R into directed edges from L to R, so away from the source. And then we create a sink and create directed edges from R, every uh, vertex in R 
to the sink. And thus we have a valid flow graph. And if we set the capacities of every edge to one, it turns out if you run maximum flow on this, we will get uh, the answer to the matching. So in this case, it's three, and you can see that the maximum flow is in fact three in this graph. So let's go through some sample problems now. Uh, this is just an implementation problem, essentially. Uh, given this is like the most simple case of flow and the most obvious case of flow problems. So you're given a network of water pipes. They can't a wall to the barn. Water, flow through, water flows through them. And you want to calculate the net flow capacity, which is net flow capacity just means max flow. So this is purely implementation. You can just run Edmunds carp on this, and it'll work fine. A slightly harder version of this, uh, this is kind of a long problem, so I'll give you a minute to read it, but this requires you to play around with some capacities. So essentially, the difference here is that you have two extra constraints. Like you can you can represent the mountain uh, and the chambers and the corridors as a flow graph, with the corridors as, as edges. But the question becomes, uh, how do you account for the fact that each biologist has to start from the source T through a different corridor and enter the sink B from a different corridor? But uh, they they can go as many can go through any intermediate corridor as they want. So the idea here is to set the capacities for every edge that starts from T to one and every edge that enters B to one. And every intermediate edge has a capacity of infinity. So what this does is it ensures that these two conditions are met. And that's actually like a relatively simple way to solve it. So this is a more complicated problem at first, it doesn't really seem like a flow problem, but it turns out that this is actually bi bipartite matching. So I'll give you a minute to think about how you would solve it. Okay, so you can represent the problem as a bipartite graph with horizontal lines as vertices in the one set and vertical lines in the other. And an edge between the horizontal and vertical lines, the two sets, represents an intersection between the two lines. So if there's a line from a horizontal edge to a vertical edge, it means that those two lines intersect. And then at that point, you can structure the graph as a flow problem and run any maximum flow algorithm. But we're not done yet. All we found is the maximum bipartite matching which is not actually what the problem wants. But we've, uh, by the maximum input theorem, we found the minimum cut of this flow network. In this case, it's also the minimum node cover of the graph. And it can be proven that the complement of the minimum node cover, i.e. every edge that's not the minimum node cover, is the maximum independent set in a graph. Thus, the answer is the total number of nodes minus the maximum flow value computed. Because the maximum flow value was the minimum cut, was the minimum cut, which was the minimum node cover. You can replay that, that doesn't make sense. Similarly to the previous problem, this one's also about bipartite matching and thus flow, even if, it doesn't, even if it doesn't look like it. So I'll give you a moment to pause and ponder. Okay, so this one's a little bit more complicated, but you can represent this one as, as well as a bipartite graph with rows as vertices in one set and columns in the other. A row is connected to a column if there is an asteroid in the intersection of that row and column. All edges have a weight of one, and same in the previous problem, all edges have a weight of one. So the minimum cut of the resulting flow network once we add our super sink and super source is guaranteed to remove all asteroids because by definition, 
the minimum cut of the network means that there are no more paths from source to sync. So what that means is essentially, if there are no more paths from source to sync, then all of the asteroids must be destroyed. You think about why that's true. The rules don't allow us to remove individual asteroids, but we can always achieve the same effect by removing some edge from the super source to a row or from a column to a super sink. Thus, the answer is simply the minimum cut, which is the maximum flow of the network. These are some past lectures and my work cited. Thank you for listening. I hope I was able to teach you something about flow.